Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Eloy Zuniga Jr., and Shippel has been my home for the last five years. <laughs> and uh, I'm actually a core developer for Tenancy, uh, the product that we've kind of been showing you guys. Okay. Uh, I started with Shippel in, I think it was February of 2007, I think that's when it was. I actually came in as a search engine marketing, uh, on, um, how do you say it, intern. And uh, I actually lasted in that for only about six months. I was actually very good. It's not, it's not like me to compliment myself, but it really was. Um, I came from another company uh, before we actually knew what search engine marketing was, before search engine optimization. All I knew is that my boss would come in and he would yell at me and he'd be like, get me on the first page of Google. And that, that was like his instruction. Uh, so I'd have to do my research and I'd always get to the top. But the only reason I really lasted about six months in that department was because the methods that I was using were black hat. I didn't know that at the time though, but it, it got me really great rankings and everybody was happy for a time and then people started realizing what was happening. But uh, <laughs> another thing that ended up happening was uh, my boss, Ed, he figured out or he found out that uh, I was a programming major. Uh, he picked me up when I was in my 11th year of college, not 11th year, whoa, no, in my <laughs> junior year of college and uh, he found out that I was majoring in programming and he found out that I was minoring in mathematics and he said, would you like to try programming? And I said, yes, I would love to try it. You know, I'd like to like, get my foot wet and just try it out. And he says, no, it doesn't work that way here. He's like, you're either in or you're out. I'm like, well, what happens if, uh, what happens if it doesn't work out? What happens if uh, I'm not good at it or I just don't like it? He's like, well, you're fired. He's like, that's the way it works. And I was like, well, what happens if I just stay here? He's like, well, then you don't move up. He's like, and that's the way of the world. Uh, so I, I went ahead and asked him the next follow-up question, which was, well, what happened to the last programmer? And uh, he said he wasn't good enough. And I said, oh, okay, he was just you know, a bad employee. He messed up somehow. He made somebody mad. He destroyed something. He's like, no, 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 he didn't do any of that stuff. He just wasn't good enough. It's like we asked him to do certain things, and uh, we had certain expectations about his delivery, and he just, just wasn't good enough. That's it. That was his whole explanation for me. And I was like, so I could possibly fail and lose everything if I'm not good enough. And he's like, once again, that's the way it works, and it was very intimidating, but uh, I do appreciate Ed. He has a habit of getting the best out of you. Um, so I did join the programming team, and I'm very proud of it, and, uh, and I've been in it ever since. One way that I'd actually like to start this session is by t telling you guys the takeaways. There's nothing like actually walking into There's nothing like actually walking into a class and then spending an hour there and learning and laughing and enjoying and everything. But then you walk out and you're like, you know, meh? Like, what exactly did I walk out with? You go home and you're like, what in the world was I learning? Uh, what did I write down? And why doesn't any of this make sense anymore? So I want to emphasize what you will be learning in this classroom so that you can focus on that uh, so that when you are listening to me, uh, you can remember, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be learning these three things, uh, and it's very important that I walk out with this, or else uh, I've wasted your time, and that's not good. Okay, so the three takeaways. Um, there are three types of services that make up the cloud. Uh, you will also learn about virtualization, exactly what it is. You'll be able to define it. You can show off to your friends. And uh, future expectations, what you should expect from the cloud. Um, this one's kind of pushed down a little bit, the social cost. Because the cloud exists, there are certain things that we're giving up, and uh, it's not that obvious, and uh, it should be. Okay, well, actually, let me start by figuring out where everybody kind of is situated. Who has heard of the cloud? Raise your hands, nice and big. So a lot of you have heard of the cloud. Okay, how many of you feel that you know, I don't know, maybe 10% of what the cloud is? It's like, you kind of get it, you could maybe explain it, all right, it makes some sense. All right, how many of you feel like you know 75% of it? Like, all right, there you go, show off. <laughs> that's Kelsey, everybody, he's awesome. Um, okay, so that's wonderful, that's actually very good. Uh, how many people are in here are developers, coders? Uh, they know what JavaScript looks like, and okay, nice. Uh, how many of you guys are marketing? I wanna see those big. Okay, so you guys are just like, what? <laughs> maybe, I'm sorry, I didn't just say that. <laughs> <laughs> and then how many of you guys are sales? Anybody? Nobody's trying to sell this. Okay, cool. 
All right. Uh, my biggest focus is going to be on the marketing people, uh, just because it really helps. Uh, developers have a better idea, a better understanding of what it all means. Uh, but that's going to be my focus. So you guys are the ones that I'm going to be kind of looking out for the most. Okay, the programmers. That's us. Um, this was the original team. Uh, this is the team that's made the majority of tendency or maintained the majority of tendency. Uh, the only reason I'm honestly showing this slide is because it always helps to put a face with the uh, people who are providing your service. It kind of changes the, the, the dynamic. Uh, I've had uh, plenty of experiences here already where I've gotten to talk to a bunch of our clients, and it makes a big difference when you actually get to hear it from them, you know, how much they appreciate it, uh, what they want from you, and just just, just everything about what your relationship really means. So this is us. Uh, our new director is actually John Michael Oswald. I didn't think he'd be in here, but there he is. Um, and he's done an awesome job, and I really appreciate him. Uh, Glenn has actually gone off to other ventures, uh, but it's us two, JMO. We have one intern, which we hope she stays. She's a very smart girl. And uh, we have one guy that's in the Philippines, uh, also a very smart guy. Okay, so the three services. It's software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. Uh, they look a little scary, don't let them confuse you too much. Uh, the one we're gonna focus on the most is software as a service, and that's mostly because it's the one that you're going to interact with the most if you have not already interacted with software as a service. Remember these, I will be quizzing you. <laughs> okay, software as a service. You may recognize some of these. Uh, there's Flickr, Netflix, Spotify. Okay, you guys have seen these. Um, I guess the best way to start with software as a service is software in general. You guys have computers, you guys have your CDs, you bring them in and you install and you go ahead and run your updates. Um, this is the way software typically works. You normally have it in your computer and it's very dependent on your computer. It's dependent on the storage of your computer, the speed of your computer, uh, all of the new uh, updates that you have on your computer. One of the problems that most businesses were having was uh, twofold. One is compatibility, trying to provide a piece of software that makes sense everywhere. This piece of software has to make sense on a Mac, it has to make sense on a Dell machine, it has to make sense with you know, all different types of technologies, all and different types of softwares, operating systems, everything, you name it. and. Uh, the fact that none of this was standardized made it very difficult, or in business talk, made it very expensive. People don't want to invest all that. People want to just, you know, focus in on the majority and then sell to them. And then, of course, you have the people that are left out, and that's just not nice. Uh, plus, that's money left on the table. You don't want to do that either. Okay, so one of the biggest reasons uh, companies started looking to software uh, online is because they would solve that problem. They would solve the problem of resources, uh, system requirements, more specifically. The other problem they were trying to solve is the cost of distribution. In order to make a piece of software, you need a severe amount of testing. And the only reason you need a severe amount of testing is because if you find a bug in that software, once it's already been released, it's a huge pain to try and fix it. Uh, trying to get a patch out there and then telling your customers, hey, you know that software you just bought has a bug in it? Yeah, can you buy this other thing to fix the bug that we made for you? Uh, it's not very nice, once again. Uh, then later on, people started offering patches via the internet, um, and even that was a big headache. People didn't want to go and try to update everything and install. People just don't like doing updates. They're, it's maintenance. People don't like maintenance. So two problems they were trying to solve. And uh, they did this through software online. Now, before I mention the rest of the stuff, I'd like to mention Ajax. Um, who here is familiar with Ajax? Lots of you, very nice. Uh, Ajax is uh, ver a very much sung, uh, unsung hero. Uh, you don't hear too much about it when you hear about the cloud. Uh, but Ajax is one of the biggest reasons that the cloud is possible. Um, who here remembers Hotmail when you would click on something, or like, like you'd click on a message and the entire page would have to load before you could actually see that message? Big annoyance, huge. But we didn't realize how annoying that was until Gmail came around. You went, you went to Gmail and you're like, oh my God, I can click on a message, it pops up. I can click on a page and it keeps going. I can drag items. This is amazing, dragging, it's beautiful. Uh, the interesting part about those features on the internet is that we don't relate those to software that sits on your computer, you know? 
you're not wowed at Microsoft Word whenever you click on a prompt and the entire thing reloads. It's like, it's an expectation. You expect client-side code or client-side applications to behave a certain way, and you expect online software to behave a certain way. And uh, Ajax definitely changed that game. Uh, if you don't understand this entire graph, it's perfectly fine. The most important part to notice, should have a laser, is that gap. This is the gap where you're waiting for the loading. That's the gap where you're waiting for the loading again. Every time you push or click on an element, you're sitting there waiting. And once again, huge annoyance. We didn't know it before. Ajax came around and made it obvious to us. Uh, this is Ajax at work. Once again, you don't have to understand all of it. All you have to understand is that that line on top, solid. You're not sitting there waiting for the entire page to reload every single time. And that is a huge beauty. Um, and because of Ajax, it's easy for us to imagine a world where software can be online because now the two can behave exactly the same way. Okay, so back to software as a service. Once again, businesses were looking to solve those two problems and they were able to do it with Ajax technology and putting it on the internet. The interesting part about what companies did when they solved those problems is they accidentally ran into beneficial byproducts like there were good things that came out of it that they had no idea they were even investing in. Um, I actually have a flashcard for that only because I have horrible memory. Okay, so some of the byproducts that came out of moving software to the internet were uh, data consolidation. The idea that whenever you're actually putting your information into these systems, uh, the company could actually grab that information from you and then get more statistics out of it and then ironically they can sell it right back to you which is very interesting or they could sell it to advertisers so more money wonderful thing uh, another interesting byproduct of all of that was uh, instant monitoring you could watch people use your application and if you saw them you know hesitating in a certain feature they could fix it um, another thing that ended up happening was uh, sharing this is a huge deal uh, Flickr and Picasa specifically. I don't know how many of you guys are considered the photographers in your family, but you go, you take your photos, and then you have, you know, that grandma or that aunt that says, give me a copy, you know? Can you do that for me? And then you have those pictures on your camera for a good week, maybe a month, and you have yet to share them with her. One of the biggest reasons that happens is because before all of these services came around, you would have to email those photos to people. And people didn't have that kind of hardware. People couldn't accept 20 megs worth of photos. Grandma wasn't gonna sit there and wait for images to load or for that loading thing to go away. It just wasn't gonna happen. Um, so this was once again a byproduct, something that they accidentally fixed. Um, now some companies were focused on it, but most companies were focused on the revenue of it all. Um, another interesting byproduct was uh, accessibility. The fact that you don't have to be on your machine anymore to listen to your music. My music is my music no matter where I'm at. Uh, Spotify did a wonderful job of this, Pandora did it, GrooveShark did it, uh, and there are other services as well. Um, once again, accessibility, the fact that I can gain access to all of my data from anywhere. Software as a service, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, but these are the byproducts that came from investing in this. Uh, so now I'm gonna give you guys a small pop quiz. Uh, who, again, was marketing? Raise your hands. All right, can one of you answer what the three services are again? This was the first one. What's the other two? Anybody? No volunteers. Say it again. And what's the other one? Okay, I was gonna throw this at you, but I'm nervous, <laughs> so I won't. <laughs> okay, sweet. So it's software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. This is the part that you guys are gonna deal with the most. If you own a business, you're gonna get to see more about the other two. So once again, uh, let's go back to our pyramid. Software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, and talk about virtualization. We're gonna be uh, moving on to, we're, not gonna, we're gonna skip over platform as a service for right now and go directly to information as a service. Uh, but before I do that, I want to explain virtualization to you guys. Virtualization, in layman's terms, is taking something that's tangible and digitizing it. That's pretty much what it is, that's what it boils down to. So these are actual tangible computers. You sit there, you buy them, uh, and they're yours, they're purchased. Uh, and the idea behind virtualization is being able to mimic those computers virtually. Now most people would think that's insane. It's like, why would you grab something physical and then just make it digital? You know, invest all of that money and all of that resource 
just to make it digital. Um, and I can explain that to you in a minute. Uh, but the biggest portion to focus on here is the blue area where it says virtual machines. Just remember that those are those machines made by these actual hardware machines. And then I'll explain to you once again why that's so important. Our current inf infrastructure for tenancy, or the old version of tenancy, uh, doesn't look this fancy, but something like this. And uh, we have our computers. They're all lined up nice and neat. Uh, what ends up happening, and it's not that hard to imagine, is when we get a website, we start filling up these computers, these servers. And they're filling up, they're filling up, everything's wonderful, we're making money, they're happy. Uh, we're providing value. But then we get to, let's say, the 50th website, and our server is full. Now we have to invest in a brand new server for this 51th customer. That means that's a lot of upfront costs. For one customer, um, we have to pay for the hardware, we have to pay for the software, we have to pay for the configuration, uh, we have to pay for licensing. Thank you, Microsoft. And, uh, and we don't even know if we're going to get more customers. Obviously, we think we are, so we go ahead and invest. But once again, a big upfront cost, and we want to kind of push that to the side. Um, when I think of our current infrastructure, I don't think of this. I honestly think of this guy. He's going to kill me. Uh, this is Rodney. Uh, Rodney is our IT guy. He really will kill me. But uh, he's our IT guy. He's awesome. He's a rock star. He's the guy that gets up at 2 AM uh, when everything crashes, when we're overloaded, when there's too many websites. And uh, he will sit there and he will work on these machines. He will purchase new servers. He will configure them. He will stay awake for three days. I don't know how he does that. And uh, it's the four locos. It is. That's exactly what it is. Uh, Rodney's wonderful. And I'm sure many of your companies have a person that's just like this. Unfortunately, Rodney is not scalable. Uh, yesterday, we offered a service or we started something new that was a self sign up. The idea that anybody can go ahead and create their own website, test it out for 30 days. Now, Rodney would have a cow if he knew that he had to configure one of these new machines every time a new website came around. It would just be horrible. Uh, another disadvantage of having physical computers is a uh, bad economy. Let's say we were to lose 100 customers. Now we have two extra servers that aren't making money, but they're still costing us. They're costing us in licensing. They're costing us in... Um, storage, we have to actually pay for where they're located at, uh, and we're costing us in maintenance because the software will get old and it will need to be updated. So our revenue is now below our costs. We are negative, which is not good. Um, so once again, Rodney, wonderful guy. In comes infrastructure as a service. The idea that there are services out there that will provide this hardware out there for us. So these services will make our infrastructure for us. They will do what Rodney does for the most part. Uh, not all of it, but for the most part. Um, now, here's a question. How does an online service provide hardware? Anyone? <laughs> OK. Huh? Through the cloud. Through the cloud. No, you can't use that. <laughs> it's the session. Uh, OK, now let me ask it a different way. How does... Uh, how do any one of these companies provide hardware digitized? We just learned this, ladies and gentlemen. Or not. There we go. Virtualization. Exactly. That's how these companies are able to offer. Who said that? Oh, who said that? I'm going to believe you. <laughs> okay. You're welcome. I should really be telling you which ones you want, but or asking. Uh, virtualization. That's exactly how these companies are able to offer this hardware to you. And uh, this is probably one of the bigger uh, like misconceptions of uh, the cloud, because everybody just says, you know, it's up there somehow. I don't really understand how, but it's there. Uh, so we are storing the data. It is on hardware, but it's digitized hardware. It's, uh, it's, it's, an it's not an imitation, but it's a, just a digitized version of it. And that's one of the bigger pieces of infrastructure. Uh, so once again, software as a service, which you saw, it's just getting your client-side applications and putting them on the internet. Infrastructure as a service, that's getting all those computers that are networked together and uh, giving it to you virtually. This was your answer. So now we're down to platform as a service. Platform as a service is a little easier to explain and the only reason I went in this funny order is because platform as a service is actually infrastructure as a service 
but platforms are a little bit more abstracted. There are specific needs for a website to work. Uh, our old Tennessee technology consisted of having uh, something that would, uh, it's called a, now I'm blanking here, it's, a, it's not a web host, it's a web server. It, it actually reads the URL, and then it knows what folder to point at to get its actual files. Uh, we have the host, which holds all of your information, and then we have the database, which holds all of your textual data. Uh, this is what most website infrastructures look like. Now, each one of those pieces put together make up a platform. When you get a more complicated website, you have things like uh, an index server, you have a caching server, you have a load balancer. You have all of these different services. Once again, you don't have to know what all these things mean, but what's important is that every one of these things put together make up a platform, and these companies have realized that uh, this kind of service is very valuable to companies such as ourselves and anybody else who owns any kind of web-based company. Now, wonderful companies like Google and Facebook have their own infrastructure. They don't have to depend on services like this, but what's wonderful about services like this is it gives everybody a leg up. It makes it possible for everybody to go ahead and kind of compete with that same, uh, that same space. Okay, uh, so that's actually the biggest part of the cloud. And once again, we went through the whole pyramid. It's, it's not that complicated. Uh, I will take questions, because I know a lot of you want to come in here and be able to say, okay, I, I understand the cloud now. It makes sense. It's software that's online. It's hardware that's digitized. Um, and there are these companies that are providing it for us. Uh, it's my stuff online. Um, one thing that I did want to mention, and that was towards the end of the session, was I wanted to explain the social cost of having information on the cloud. And most of you have experienced it, uh, uh, but we will only continue to experience it more. And that is the value of privacy. Um, privacy is going to become more and more valuable as we move forward, only because all of your data is getting sent up to this cloud. It no longer sits on your computer. It's no longer yours. Um, it is, but you know, it is in, in, a, like in a tangible sense. Um, so there's privacy. It's definitely an issue, something worth considering, something worth thinking about, uh, not to make people nervous. Some people are very happy about this. Some people like the idea of just being recognized everywhere. And some people are, are frightened. They're feared. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's not a good feeling sometimes. Uh, the other thing to consider, as a social cost is uh, ownership. What exactly is ownership at this point? Uh, does ownership mean I have access to it? Does ownership mean that it's actually sitting on my computer? Or does ownership mean that you know, there's this special place that only I can go to and retrieve the data? Uh, but these are definitely two points uh, worth paying special attention to. Um, and uh, those are, those are the, the main topics. So once again, the cloud is made up of this pyramid, and uh, and these are just the only parts that you really need to know about the cloud. Um, I guess uh, from here, I really wanted to just kind of take it to a more of a Q&A style about what we're doing with tendency specifically and the cloud. Um, actually, before I get to that, one thing I wanted to mention was yesterday, I don't know how many of you were here for Dries' talk, and he was comparing open source technology to proprietary technology. And he was saying how um, he had four pillars. I can't remember all four, but I remember three of them. It was community, it was platform, and it was cloud. And he was explaining how the open source community could definitely benefit from the cloud. Proprietary software such as Tendency can also benefit from the cloud. Everyone can benefit from the cloud. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of companies that are heavily invested in their infrastructure, and it's difficult for them to move. But we're very proud to say that our new technology has moved, and we're definitely going to be using that. Um, another big thing was uh, community. Uh, I don't know how much JMO has actually talked about it, but we've designed the system so that anyone, any developer can come in and actually contribute to it. Um, and once again, this is all possible because of the cloud. Once again, something that can compete with open source software. Uh, not that it needs to compete, but it's important to know that there is no monopoly, uh, that everyone is still in nice open space. And then platform, as I mentioned earlier, uh, has everything to do with um, the services that are already provided online for us and the fact that we can use those as well. And that's like the biggest point. Um, I guess, do I have any questions? Or are there any questions? Yes. Um, yeah. Less of a cost, less of a 
Yes, yes. Those are all, those are both wonderful questions. Um, I'm going to go on a limb here and say, yes, it is unlimited. Um, obviously, it's, it's only going to go as deep as your pocket does. Uh, so if you can afford it, you can definitely get all of your data online, put it into the cloud. Uh, and as far as cost goes, yes, that's actually one of the biggest reasons we're moving to the cloud, only because we can save on all of those costs and then pass it on to our customers. Um, I forgot the price point, the lowest price point. Is it 39 or 35.99? 39.99? And that's something that we've never been able to offer with Tenancy, never. Uh, the, the product has existed, I think, since 2001. Um, and until that time, I think the lowest price point we had was uh, maybe $1,000. Could be wrong about that. Uh, but once again, we are passing those savings on, and these other companies can do that as well. Yes. Yes. Actually, I've got three questions. Go for it. One, what about redundancy backup? Okay. You do. Okay. Security is another major factor. Yes. Uh, if people can hack into the uh, Intagon, they can hack into anything. That's a, that's a major concern right now. Yes. Uh, and then the other factor is crashes totally when their networks go down, which Google has been known to do quite often. It has gone down. Yes, it definitely has. Okay, so the questions were, um, let me see if I can repeat this. Okay, it's redundancy, and then you also mentioned uh, the security aspect of it. And uh, you mentioned the, uh, well, you just mentioned that Google was also brought down, correct? Right, right. Stability. Crashing. Stability? Yeah. Okay. So with redundancy, okay. I guess the easiest way to answer that question is Amazon's web services, specifically for us, and there's other services that you can use out there. We're depending on them because, I mean, they've done such a great job and there's a lot of third-party validation. There's a lot of people using them as well. But um, what's wonderful about using the cloud is the fact that they are focused on those issues. We are a web marketing company. We are concerned with providing value through our software. We are concerned with your brand. We have less time or we have less focus on actually the, those little niches, those security updates, those little holes in the software, not in the software, but the holes in the hardware. Uh, and that's what Amazon is taking care of uh, for us. Uh, you can purchase redundancy through Amazon. Uh, and that's one of the wonderful features. That's just one of the wonderful features that they have. Uh, for those of you who don't understand redundancy, it's the idea of not holding your information in one given location. If there was a storm to hit Houston and our servers were sitting here, you wouldn't have to worry. That information is spread out across the entire nation, if not across the entire world, depending on how we set it up. Um, so that if anything were to happen physically, you do not lose your stuff. It's a, once again, very good question. Uh, and security-wise, once again, they're the ones that are focused on all of this stuff. Uh, Google has gone down, um, and they went down because of, I, I believe it was brute force attack. And then, it, There's been several times that Google has gone down. And, totally and then another one, I think, like somebody clicked the button somewhere, and they sent too much internet to like China or something like that, and they just kind of crossed everything out. Uh, once again, the beautiful part about that is it did go out, but no security was compromised. In other words, no data was gained. It was just a an inconvenience, a huge inconvenience. Yes. There you go. It's a wonderful analogy. Exactly. So, it, it, no, it's a very. <laughs> Keeps it in gold. That's what he does. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I can't remember the name of the software we use, but after all of this. Okay. Between the different cloud providers? Wow, that's insane. Standing cloud. I don't know how many whispers I heard of Inception. It's like Inception. <laughs> One way to think of it, yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so I can actually go ahead and finish this off. Uh, my name is Eloy Zuniga Jr. I have been with the company for five years. Uh, 
we are investing heavily in the cloud. Uh, we definitely provide. We definitely believe it's going to provide the most value for you guys. And uh, I hope this gives you a little bit more insight about what the cloud is. I hope that you guys still aren't a little confused. Um, I want you guys to be able to go to the water cooler and say, yeah, I know exactly what it means. I know that it means that I'm putting my stuff not on my machine. It's not limited by my machine. And, uh, and the fact that corporations can take advantage of virtual hardware. And that's like the biggest, that's, that's like probably the biggest thing to take away from all of this. Do you have a question? That, that actually is something I kind of ran over. Um, I told you guys, I lied to you. I told you that I would, uh, was going to tell you about the future of the cloud and what's expected from it. Um, ideally, from what I understand, what people really want is they want, oh, I can't believe I'm about to say Windows, but they want a window. They want this device, this portal that they can just pick up and access the cloud from. It doesn't matter what it is, and that's pretty much the end goal. Now this portal or this window would be available anywhere. It would be your mobile phone, it'd be your iPad or your tablet. Uh, it could even be on your kitchen counter. It could be on the door of the front of your house. It could be anywhere. And the idea would be that there's this information, once again, that's stored up there and accessible from almost any device. So yes, definitely, there, I, I believe that there will be a point when hardware is no longer There you go. Um, if you look at their, not the Chrome browser, but they actually have a Chrome operating system, and they've modified Linux and took out all of the stuff that does hardware access on the laptop, and really all it is is the laptop is used to get to the internet, and so then everything's in the cloud. They have a little commercial where they like take the laptop, they type a little bit, and then they like throw it into a press and destroy the laptop. And grab another laptop and boot it up and it's right there and the data is all still there because nothing even happens on the laptop. It doesn't even need a hard drive. It's just talking to Google Cloud Services and everything's up there. So if your laptop gets lost and you're like, oh, someone's going to get to my data, you just revoke access to that remote computer and then there's nothing on the hard drive for them to even steal. It's all... Yeah, there's nothing on there. It's all in the cloud, exactly. I, I don't know what that's going to say about our, like, our economy and the way we dispose of things so easily. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but that's, that's generally the idea. The idea is that your stuff, like the piggy bank analogy, it's not just sitting in one location. It, everything is just used to access it, and that's the eventual goal. This makes a lot of people very comfortable, and this makes a lot of people at the exact same time, once again, very uncomfortable. Um, so... Wonderful. Uh, I know it wrapped up a little bit early, uh, which kind of makes me a little happy because I didn't want to make the cloud too complicated because it's really not, it's not that difficult. Oh, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Okay, so it was actually about your last slide, and I was just curious, and it might just be an opinion thing, but who does actually own it? Is there an answer? Do we know? Um, like, for example, I had a tweet that was featured in an article about cloud search that I had no idea what I was even featured in that article until I just ended up Googling something and came across it. So for me, that was my tweet, but then it's in this article about cloud. So who owns it? Who, who owns? owns it? Uh, I think with some, I mean, this is, some, this is something that you could definitely argue back and forth about, especially with Twitter, um, because most would say, well, Twitter would definitely say that belongs to us. You typed it into our system, it's ours, uh, but you can use it. And, um, yeah, you can definitely argue for, with, with different things. Uh, one of the biggest things that we're recommended to do, specifically with images, is uh, we go ahead and make sure that their signature is somehow included so that people know that we're borrowing this, but we don't own it. Um, specifically with Tendency, we're making it so that you can take all of your data back with you. Uh, so if you were to ever import everything into Tendency, we are making it so that you can easily take all of it right back out and put it wherever it is that you'd like. Um, I know Facebook has certain, it actually has an option now where you can download everything for yourself. So once again, it's ownership, but you have to take the initiative to go in there and grab it for yourself. Um, Twitter also has another application, if you're a little savvy with the web, where you can make it, make a copy of all of your Twitter feeds, 
and then you can store it on top of your own server so that you always have access to it. Um, I do that for myself. I've been doing it for like the last three years. It's kind of nice. It's cool. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it is a complicated question to ask. Um, and once again, even if you did own the data, what would you do with it? <laughs> How would you read it? <laughs> like, so th there, there's a lot of interesting things that go with ownership. Um, for Twitter specifically, But that's not to say that both of you can't own it. I so own my I photo, and so do they. Use it. All those disclosures very closely. Just so that I don't hurt anybody here, it's going to be you, Kelsey, and then it'll be Keith. Uh, go ahead. Comment on it? Go ahead. If I'm licensing it to them, am I making money from doing that? <laughs> Does that? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> You're licensing. Because you license that media type, you license that cassette, in that yeah, in that format. Correct. I'm sorry about that, Kelsey. Um, I was going to kind of echo what they said. Yeah, go for it. The interesting is back in you know, the day when you would want to write a letter to the editor, you write a letter to the editor, you send them that letter, they tell you this letter is now ours. We, this is our content. And it's, it's actually much harsher than what we have today where they're basically licensing the content. I think the gray area would be where um, you have individuals that post a photo or they send in content and that content misrepresents them or is used in a, in a way that they wouldn't want it to be used. I think that's the legal gray area that we still have to figure out. Sweet. Well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm very, well, I'm very happy that you guys like have all of this uh, knowledge together and I'm happy that you guys were able to share all of this. I really do appreciate it. There's always more that you can learn from the attendees or the audience than anybody else. Uh, so once again, uh, this is my time. Uh, thank you, everybody.